Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I'm very pleasantly surprised. If you were looking for Duncan, Johan, or Cormac, you are in the wrong room. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you're, <laughs> but if you are interested in any of the topics I'm going to talk about, which is VMs and Kubernetes, then you are in the right room. So, thank you very much for coming. My name is Katarina Brookfield. I'm the Staff Technical Marketing Architect at VMware by Broadcom. Uh, and I focus on vSphere Tanzu and anything related to that. So the topic I chose for this presentation was to talk about something that I think still a lot of people don't know about, and that's how we are working with VMs on Kubernetes. There seems to be a lot of stigma around virtual machines and Kubernetes, as if it would be something legacy, something that doesn't have its place in this whole modern apps, cloud native world. <coughs> but and there are even people who are saying that all of the VMs will be eventually replaced by containers. <laughs> but personally, I don't think that's the case. How many of you run VMs today? Right? Do we really think all of these will be taken away and replaced by containers? I've never seen this as a black and white scenario. It's yes, some of them will. Some will be hopefully refactored and containerized, but you will still have virtual machines. But just because we have virtual machines around, doesn't mean that we can't change the way we think about them. So what I would like you to do is, if I would ask you to think of a car, would you think of something like this? Or maybe perhaps more something like this? The only thing I can guarantee is that none of you are thinking of this. <laughs> and because we are in an AI world, I have actually asked my journey as well to generate a picture of a car. And apparently, according to Chet, uh, uh, Midjourney, we all drive Ferraris, which is a good thing. So well done, us. But ultimately, whatever your choice is, it's still a car. It's just a car that has been through hundreds of years of innovation and change. So in the next 45-ish minutes, I would like to challenge the way you think about the virtual machines and show you that we can change the way we deploy and manage them. So what I'm going to talk about today is something we call VM service. Are any of you familiar with what VM service is? OK, <laughs> good. Um, so just to introduce this again, VM service is one of the services we offer with vSphere Tanzu, which is our Kubernetes platform on vSphere. And before we go into the details, I will just go through some of the components that come into the whole workflow, just to make you familiar with those. So we will start with something that's a, on the left side, a content source, and that is your content library in your vCenter. In this content library, you will store your VM image. You can think of a VM image as your template of a VM, so it has your OS, your specs, and your disk. We define something we call a VM class, which is a specification of the resources you are attaching to a VM. Also a storage class, this defines which data store you will use for this workflow. You wrap this all out uh, in a YAML manifest, which is your VM specification. You then apply this manifest, which will trigger the VM service, which is done by the VM operator. And in the end, you will end up with a VM. Are any of you familiar with Kubernetes? OK, good. So just to give you some idea, without going too deep, how VM service actually works. So as you know, in, in Kubernetes, you have your control plane. On your con control plane, you will have a bunch of operators running, and one of that is VM operator. So uh, it has its own namespace uh, called VMware system VM op for operator with a bunch of controllers running in there. And any of the CRDs, so the custom resource definitions, uh, are stored in the etcd database. Um, and these are the new types we have introduced, such as virtual machine, virtual machine image, or virtual machine network. So those will all be stored in your etcd. Now, just going quickly back to the VM class, I would like to uh, just to give you a bit more information on that. So as I said, that's where you define your resources for your VM. And we do, um, so like your CPU, your memory, um, and things like that. We do provide 16 default VM classes, um, which you can use. But the main power is that you can also create your own ones. So for example, if you want to add an additional instance storage, or for example, PCI devices, such as a GPU card, you can define your own VM classes that will define the resources that will be attached to this VM. 
And I'm a very big believer in showing the art of possible. So what we will do today is actually go through a series of demos. They will all build up on, on top of each other. Uh, and we will start with some basics and then I will show you some of the new stuff that we have introduced as well. So in this first demo, we will create a image for a, for a VM. In my case, I will show you how to do bring your own image. So create your own image. It will be Ubuntu based. We will create a content library where we will store our VM images. We will import this image to the content library and we will deploy a Linux VM. So this is my lab and my vCenter. And as you can see here, I have an Ubuntu 22.04 box. So all I have done is downloaded the Ubuntu image, installed it, clean cloud in it, because that's a good thing to do, <laughs> powered it off. And all I'm going to do now when I start, I'm going to power off this VM. And I'm going to export it as an LVS template. So your standard operation in vCenter. So this is something you would do just once in your environment to prepare the base image. Um, I will wait for all of my files to be downloaded. And now I can go into content libraries and I will create a new content library that will store my images. I'm not very good at naming, so I'm going to call it VM images. And this will be a local content library. So I'll just do the default. I will select the data store where I want to store these. And that's my content library now created. Now I can go in there and in actions, I will upload the OVF file that I have previously exported. So I will just select all of those files for my Ubuntu box. And I will just wait for this to be imported, depending on the size of your VM. It depends how long it will take. But you can also see it in your recent task as the files are being copied over. So I can see my image is now ready. The next thing I will need to do is I will need to go to my namespace and I will need to associate this new content library with the namespace. So under VM service, I will add a content library and just select the checkbox for my new one. And now I will be able to start consuming these images in this namespace. Okay, so now I will log into my supervisor. Hopefully you can see that. I will set my contacts to my namespace, so namespace one in my case. And if I now get content library, I can see my content library is there. I can also do get on virtual machine images or VMI, and I can see that my image is there. So it's all ready to be used. I can also see which VM classes are available to me. So these are the 16 default ones that I mentioned before. I'm just going to copy the image name. And this is my VM spec. So we have three sections. In the first one, I'm defining my virtual machine. So I'm giving it a name. I'm saying which namespace it should go to, the image I want to use to deploy this VM, um, my storage class, um, and some other configuration. Selecting my network is NSXT in this case. And I'm also specifying that I want to transport my configuration using cloud in it onto this machine. In the second section, so this is, this is the cloud in it section, I am configuring my VM. So I will create a user that I will use to log into this machine in the first section. But then in my commands, I will run a bunch of commands to, for example, install kubectl, the vSphere plugin. I'm also doing my search because I want to connect securely to my supervisor. 
So this is a configuration of the VM that will be done on top of it as soon as it's deployed. And the last section is a virtual machine service of a type global enter to expose my virtual machine on port 22 so I can SSH onto it afterwards. So this is my YAML specification for the full virtual machine. Now I will go and apply this and I can see all my three objects were created. And in the inventory, you can see my CLI VM was created, powered on, and now it's being configured. If I do get VMs with white output, I can see my IP has been assigned. And if I get a service, I can see the external IP of the machine. So now I'm going to SSH onto it using the, the user I created. And to test that all my commands are working fine, I'm going to log into my supervisor. So this will test my kubectl was installed correctly, my vSphere plugin is working fine. And if I don't get any certificate issues, I know my certs are working as well. So that is just to prove that all the configuration we have defined has been successfully completed. So that's how you deploy a virtual machine using Kubernetes on vSphere, which is pretty neat. Um, that's something that's been there for a while, but we've done a lot of work in the recent releases of vSphere, specifically in vSphere 8 Update 2. And one of the new things we have introduced is something we call the VM image service. So in the scenario I showed you before, your VI admin would prepare an image, upload it to the, to the library, and then, and I will preface this, when I use the term DevOps, I'm not specifically talking about the persona because to me DevOps is more about principles and methodologies rather than an actual job title. So that can be either a DevOps engineer, a platform engineer, a VI admin who's taking on this role as well. So anybody who is consuming this. So what VM image service allows us to do is to change the content libraries from being purely readable to writable. So now as a consumer, I can create my own images and upload them to this content library to be, to be consumed. So again, uh, I will show you a quick demo of how this works. So we are in the same environment as before and we have our CLI VM in there. Now I will get my content libraries and we will see that it's currently set to writable false. So in order to change this, I will log into my vCenter as root at the moment, uh, to do this, you have to use the data center uh, CLI, so I will do that. I'll run it in an interactive mode. And I will first get my namespace to get the details. So I'm getting my namespace instance. And this gives me all my information about my namespace, but what I need here is to take the ID of the content library. And then use a very simple command to change it to, uh, uh, to, change it to writable. All of this is documented as well, um, so it's quite easy to follow. Um, and now if we check, we can see that it's set to writable true. So let's test that. So in order for this to work, uh, we have introduced something, uh, a new CRD that's called the Virtual Machine Published Request. So I will show you how that works. So first, if I check my images, I can see the original image um, listed there. And here I have a YAML for Virtual Machine Published Request. And it has two sections. So one is the source, which is my source VM. And the target will be the new one, the new image, and I'm also pasting the content library where I want to publish this image. So that's the actual CRD and the spec that I'm going to execute. And once that's created, we can see in our recent tasks that it's doing its job. So the files are being transferred to the content library now.
and once it's all completed, I can get my images and I can see my new images now published in my content library. Okay, so that was just to show you how that works, but the main power of that is that implementing this allowed us to do something else, and that was to integrate with HashCorp Packer. Have any of you used Packer before for your images, right? <laughs> so for, <laughs> for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with Packer, uh, it's a very popular tool for uh, building, customizing of your VM images, and we have released a third type of a builder that I will show you that is specifically made for VM service. So now you can utilize HashiCorp Packer to go through this flow. So for those who, of you who are not familiar, the flow is simple. We will define a Packer template file. This can be either in JSON or in HCL format, which is HashiCorp language. Um, we will execute this on a workstation that has Packer plugin installed. So we will use the CLI VM that I have previously deployed to do this. That will kick off the VM service and that will create our image in the content library. So again, let's see how that works. I will guide you through the setup just so you can see how simple it is. Um, so I will start on the official Packer website and I will go to download Packer. Now because I'm using Ubuntu, I'm going to select Linux and just copy the install command. And here on my CLI VM, I'm just going to paste them in and wait for all of those things to be installed. Okay, that's all done. Now I'm going to just check that it's working, the command. I'm going to go back to the documentation as well. And if you go to integration and search for vSphere, On the bottom, we can get the installation for the vSphere plugin. So we'll install that. Okay, so that's installed. And now, if we go back, you can see there are three types of builders on the left side. So the new one is called vSphere Supervisor. And in this documentation, you can see its description of how it works and what it does. But you can also find some examples for the templates um, that are there, both uh, JSON and HCL. And also on the bottom, there are some required fields that you have to include in your template. So those are listed there, as well as some optional ones. So now I'm going to show you the template. So I'll start from the bottom actually. So this build section is what does the configuration of the, of the image. So we will just do a very simple hello Packer text file just to prove that it works, but that's the power of the configuration. And in the source, we're defining some of the required fields, so VM class um, and things like that. I'm also creating a SSH user called Packer that I will use to log into the machine. And I'm also specifying the publish image name. So what, what will be the name of the image I'll publish and the location. And also interesting is the keep input artifact just to keep the source virtual machine in these images so I can show you how that works. So just verifying my content library uh, image name and ID are correct. And now I'm going to take this over to my CLI machine and just create a file there. I'm just going to call it template. and I'm going to paste this all in. And just save it and exit. And now I'm just going to kick this off. So I'm going to do packer build and refer to the template. And this will start the deployment. So what you can see, what it's doing, it's connecting to the supervisor, it's validating all of the information we have provided. It is, um, it is creating the, the objects, the virtual machine, 
and now it's waiting for the virtual machine to be powered on so it can can continue with its configuration so it will just wait for that vm to be on and now that the vm is powered on it is just waiting for it to have an ip assigned so it can connect to it using ssh and run through the configuration So now it has an IP, it will connect using SSH. And now it's doing the build section, so any of the commands that I provision to configure the VM, it ran through that. And once it's all complete, it's just waiting for the image to be published to the content library. And as you can see, it took little over three minutes to define, build, and customize my VM. So now if I check my images, I can see my Packer images there. And because I kept the artifact, I can also see the source VM still in my inventory. I can see that it has an IP assigned. And I'm going to get the external IP. And another thing I want to show you, when you are this DevOps persona, you don't want to break out of the uh, cycle. So in order to check the web console of the VM, I can do it using my kubectl vSphere VM web console command, which gives me a an URL, and I can open that in my browser. So as a consumer, I don't need to have access to vCenter. So I can see my machine is there, and it's all configured. I will use the Packer user that I have specified in my spec to log in. And then I will just check that my text file is created. So as I, as I mentioned, this was a very simple demonstration of how you would do some sort of configuration, but think of it as a very powerful way of not only deploying your VMs, but also the doing the configuration bit. Packer itself integrates with other tools like Ansible for your configuration management. So you can see where we're going with this. We are allowing you to open this up to really do VMs in a declarative manner and then integrate it with other tools that you may use. And the one last thing I would like to cover as well is something that was still missing in this scenario, and that was Windows VMs. Based on our statistics, 65% of all virtual machines running on vSphere are Windows. And you may think that, oh, that's probably just VDI. Large portion of it is, but still the majority are Windows servers. So we really need to start looking at ways of how we are managing Windows as well uh, with these constructs. So I'm going to show you how that works. Again, this is something we have just introduced in update two. Um, back in my lab, we're going to start with uploading an image of Windows. So I'm just going to take this off. I'm going to go to the content library and upload the Windows image. Now, all I have done with this was similar as I've shown you before with the bring your own image. So I have created a Windows server, installed the operating system. The only other things I've done was install VM tools because those are required to pass configuration through. And I've also disabled <laughs> firewall because in my lab I want to RDP onto it. Um, so nothing else. It's a, it's a plain vanilla Windows Server operating system installation. I have then exported it as OVF and now importing it into my content library. And now that we can see the images in there, <coughs> If I get my images, I can see I now have my Windows image ready to be used. So I'm going to copy the image name and go into my spec. Now the spec again is the same as we've seen for Linux. Uh, so again, defining name and some of the basic configuration. But the main difference in here is that our transport mode is now sysprep. So uh, there are ways of using cloud init with Windows, but Windows being Windows, sysprep is uh, the preferred way to go. If you've worked with sysprep before, you may know it's quite complex. So that's what we are defining in the second section. 
And you probably don't want to be writing this all out by yourself uh, because it's this prep. So the best way to do this is actually go to our upstream documentation for VM operator. And we have a specific section for sysprep. And this will guide you through the minimal configuration that you have to include in your, in your config. So in the minimal config, uh, the, the first section does things like configure your networking. So for example, it, set, uh, it looks for the first Ethernet uh, and NIC and configures networks on it. It does DNS configuration on it. Um, and things like that. So that's the minimal config that you have to include. So I would encourage you to just copy paste that in rather than try to type it out. And then you can do some additional things like activating windows. You can add additional user accounts. You can also automate out of the box experience so you don't have to click through like your regional settings and things. So all those samples that you have seen, I have put into my to my sysprep. So the first section, as I mentioned, it goes through the network configuration. Um, so you can just like take that as is. And what we will do as well is um, there's also a guest customization utility flag that we will set to true uh, so that we can see some events in vCenter. I'm also going to add an additional user called demo that I will then use to log into my Windows box. And uh, <laughs> I will also automate my out-of-the-box experience because I don't want to click through that. And so that's my sysprep configuration. And again, the last section, I'm creating a load balancer to expose this on port 3389 so I can RDP onto the box. So again, with all that done, I'm going to apply this. And everything is created. And if we look in the UI, we can see my Windows 2022 is now being deployed, powered on, and being configured. And we can also go and have a look at the VM and see it will go through a couple of reboots while it's doing its configuration. So we can see it's passing through. We will also see that it's logged in. It means that it passed the out of the box experience configuration as well. And if we give it a few minutes, we can, we can refresh and we will see that an IP has been assigned to this VM. And the flag that I mentioned allowed us to go to events and see that our customization has been completed. So our Windows box is now ready to be used. So if I check, it has an IP assigned, and I can get my service to get my external IP. I'm going to copy that and open an RDP connection. I'm going to use the demo user that I had in my config. And as we can see, my Windows box was installed and configured. I'm logged in with the user that I have created. And if I want to see all the sysprep details that it went through, I can go into the C drive and a sysprep uh, folder. Um, there's a file that you can open called sysprep, and this is basically the configuration that it has done. So you will see all the things you have defined, but now with values. So you can see it's edit its IP address, you can see it configured DNS. You can see the guest customization utility was set properly, so the flag complete was enabled. We can see the demo user was created and all of other out of the box settings. And that's it. So that's how, I don't know how many of you are used to deploying Windows servers. I used to be a Windows admin many, many years ago. And I can definitely tell you it did not take me five minutes to install, configure, and do everything with my VMs natively in vSphere. So I guess the whole purpose of this presentation is to really help you change the way you think about virtual machines. Virtual machines are here. They're here to stay. They are not going away. 
but we can start utilizing all of these modern concepts also to manage them. And vSphere Tanzu is one of the ways of doing it. VM service is one of the ways of doing that. So I would really like to encourage you to try this out. If you want to learn more about anything vSphere Tanzu related, this QR code will take you to our landing page. Um, there you can find anything about VM service, uh, TKG, supervisor services, or the supervisor itself in forms of demos, videos, or even links to our <coughs> YouTube channel. And if you want to connect with me, that's my bio drop. So all of my socials are on there and any events I speak at, this being my last this year. So <laughs> Uh, it's the last one, but next year I'll be back. And with that, thank you so much for coming to my session. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> we still have about 10 minutes. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You said it was update two, yeah? Yeah. Uh, update two for the last three things. So the image service, uh, Packer integration, and Windows. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So were there any licensing? Licensing problem, you mean specifically because of the way HashiCorp is changing licensing? It was a DSL license, uh, HashiCorp is changing, yeah. even if you require the code or something for a commercial application, it could be classed as a, a competitive product. Uh, to be completely honest, I'm not quite sure what their stance okay. is on this because I know they've done a lot of changes recently. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I did not run into any issues yet, but I am aware that they are changing it. So unfortunately, I can't comment on their licensing. Okay, that's fine. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I just got one thing that you're, you're okay with that. Um, it's more about it's more about having uh, a standardized product integrated with half of yours that you're charging for, um, which isn't the case here because you're using. So, vir Virtual Center mm -hmm. normally looks after my virtual machines and has like a reconciliation loop for, yes. for virtual machines. Yes. Now we're putting in Kubernetes, which is also has its mm -hmm. reconciliation loop. How mm -hmm. does that? How does that look like in terms of the motion between the underpinning host? I, I don't want to get into the weeds too much. <laughs> yes. So, to so at the moment, while you have your traditional VMs of your VMs, yes, managed by these centers. Anything you do on top of vSphere Tanzu is done in the Kubernetes fashion, so any of the VM service VMs are controlled by the VM operator. When I was deploying the VM, you can actually see that it's like controlled by WCP, which is another name for, <laughs> uh, for the supervised the, the workload uh, control plane. So that <coughs> controls it. In terms of how, uh, like feature sets and configurations and so on, um, the, the gap, is there being closed. So configuration-wise, you can do the same things, um, but there's still some work to do in order to make them fully, fully equal. I can't really uh, give you, you know, a, any exact information, but, but it will get there. But in terms of management, it's all of these are, you can see they're controlled by the VM operator. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's a lot more questions <laughs> to ask about that. We, yeah, we can do that offline as well. Any other questions? Okay. Any feedback, thoughts, anything? If not, I, I will let you go get coffee, so it's fine. Uh, is there any, any way of integrating like a GitOps methodology with it <coughs> so you can have your integration stored in, in a repo? And uh, that's something we are working towards. Um, so on vSphere Tanzu, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, we do have a concept of supervisor services. Uh, with supervisor services, you're really building the IS layer on top of your vSphere. And one of the things that we are looking at is, for example, implementing something like Argo CD. Um, so, so we are going more towards that sort of GitOps patterns as well. Um, it, it is something we're working on. Ultimately, we would like you to be able to have your repo, uh, you know, commit your changes there, and that will kick off any sort of pipelines. And all of these things that I sort of showed you, like step by step, is helping us create that full-on VM build pipeline. So it's heading that direction. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I will let you go. Thank you again.